God. Amen. I thought I got to peel her off the roof there for a minute. <laughs> she went climbing in areas I had never been that high. And I've done some of the same things you had. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's good to see you this morning. Tim, I think I stole your Bible. So if you're missing your Bible, I, I have it, okay? I'm going to put it over here in this chair. I don't want to go two Bibles. We'll be here too long. In the series of messages entitled The Secret Place, we've been dealing with prayer according to the will of God. Prayers that get answered, prayers that bring results, prayers that see, we visibly see God's hand moving in our circumstances, in our lives, in our families, in our situations, in our church. I believe God answers prayer. Now, that's been exciting to see as we, even as we have been doing this series, how many people have been coming up to me telling me and sharing testimony with me about answered prayer and how God has met a need in their life through prayer and how that they are learning now to pray more uniquely and specifically according to scripture. You can't, you can't dissect those two, prayer and the word of God. They're, they're hand in hand. We can't, we can't pray without the word of God. We won't know the will of God without the word of God. So as we've moved from talking about the, the elements of, of prayer and, and especially in the context of the will of God, last week we dealt with spiritual warfare and how we are fighting on, a, on another level, on another plane. And we cannot fight uh, on that plane without realizing that it is a spiritual plane, that there are principalities and powers and rulers of wickedness in high places as the scripture talks about. It's Satan, his demonic host, the, our enemy, who has is, who is sworn to destroy our lives. The Bible says he has but one ambition, our enemy, that's to steal, to kill, and to destroy. That's his goal. That's his, when he looks at you, when Satan looks at your family, when he looks at your life, what God's called you to do, he says, my goal and my aim and my purpose is simply absolute destruction. That's his, that's his mindset. So as we looked at this last week, we talked about the importance of understanding that we should be dressed properly if we're going to pray. And that hasn't got anything to do with our external garments of the flesh. It has everything to do with the spiritual armor and the spiritual weapons that we use in prayer. We talked about how it is a spiritual war that's going on, so it requires spiritual weapons, but also requires spiritual tactics. That leads us into our message this morning, where I want to talk to you more about the tactics and the strategies of warfare, specifically regarding those people we know that don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior. Those people that we see every day, we're around every day, some in our own, very, our own families, some in our workplace, and our neighbors, they just don't know Jesus. And some of you perhaps get frustrated with those people because they don't know Jesus. But let me give you the answer to dealing with frustrating people that don't know Jesus. It's called prayer. Prayer does still move mountains. Prayer still moves those objects. And we're going to talk about that today and regarding especially how we deal with it in praying for people with their loss. I want to open up, though, this passage from 1 Timothy chapter 2. And he talks about making supplications and prayers and intercessions and thanksgiving. He said, those need to be made for all men, for kings and all that are in high places, so that we may live a tranquil, a peaceful, quiet life in all godliness some, one passage says sincerity or gravity. This is the good and this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. Now look at these words. Who would have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth? Now I just opened up a theological can of worms, I know. When we talk about who would have all men to come saved versus those folks who say, well, it's not God's will that all men be saved. There are far too many passages that's in favor of this than there are in favor of any mindset that says, well, it's not God's will for all men, you know, to be saved. That God's just going to save the elect and God sent his son to die for the elect and so it's only going to be the elect who get saved. Well, let me say this. It will be the elect who get saved. Mark it down because they're elect of God. But it is God's will to see all men saved. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ died for our sins, but not for our sins only but for the sins of the whole world. So Jesus came and died to deal with this issue of sin that plagues the cosmos. And in doing so, we can be saved and we can be redeemed. And scripture gives us place after place of the responsibility, a commission for us to be praying. Even Paul said in regard to Israel, he said, my prayer for Israel, for all of Israel, that they be saved. That's what I'm praying for, he said. Our life, should have the same kind of passion, 
the same kind of burden that says, I want the lost to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Now we think in the context usually of dealing with that is only about, well, am I gonna be a witness? Well, we've dealt with that plenty of times. Yes, we're called to be an evangelist. We're called to be a witness. All of us without exception have that responsibility. I shared the passage from Ezekiel last week that says where God spoke and he says, I searched for a man among them who would stand, who would build up the wall and stand in the gap and delay the wrath that's to come. God said, I'm looking for somebody who'll stand in. I'm looking for somebody who'll stand up. I'm looking for someone who'll delay my wrath. Basically, God said, I'm looking for somebody who'll pray and make a difference and then follow through with what they're praying. All true evangelism, I believe, begins with prayer. Evangelism, soul winning, crusades, revivals, rallies, those are just the means and the mechanics and the mechanism that we used to pick up the spoils of war. The war is in prayer. Bible says after we put on the whole armor of God, we do what? We stand praying. So the real battle is in our prayer closet. It's on our face before God. That's where it starts. And from there, we don't move out as impotent people of God. We move out as powerful people of God to do what God's called us to do. Intercessory prayer, standing in the gap, standing for souls is not just saying, well, God, save the lost. Pray, I pray for the lost that they be saved. I believe it is standing in and moving into that spiritual arena of warfare where you say, I want God, you God, to do something supernatural in the hearts and the lives of people. I want to enter into this battle, and we've discussed already very clearly in the past sermons that the battleground first takes place in our prayer closet. And prayer becomes that place of warfare. Prayer becomes that place where we're moving our sword. Prayer becomes that place where we're, we're making a difference, where we're holding up the shield, stopping the fiery darts, where we're lifting up the word of God, claiming the promises of God. And here's the beautiful thing about praying, that no matter where you are in the world, if I'm praying for you, God's moving. No matter where your friends are, your loved ones, your family, you may be separated by time and space, but God is not. God is omnipotent as well as omniscient. He knows what you're praying and he's moving in regard to your prayer. I wanna look at this today. It's a pretty simple outline about strategic praying and, and praying in three different arenas, so to say, or in three different directions. It's, it's like it's a three-prong attack in our, in, our spra- in our prayer life. And uh, how it works is, in fact, I was given this little gospel track, one of the gospel tracks, a little pamphlet on praying for the lost that uh, my brother gave to me shortly after I met the Lord and told me, hey, this, we've been handing out to people and this is how we've been praying for you, you know, for, for you to come to know Christ. And it was it's such a powerful but little simple outline that talked about strategic praying. It's kind of like sending out, you know, smart bombs. Y'all, y'all know what smart bombs are, right? It's not the bombs that I'm not holding, first of all, right? <laughs> Smart bombs are those bombs that are, are, are computerized. They're, they're engineered so as to find the location. The GPS coordinates are lay, located. They operate off the different satellites orbiting around our Earth, and they select the locations that have been strategically programmed, and they're delivered exactly to that precise point. The same thing happens with our prayer. It's strategic. It's delivered to the right place at the right time by the right means and by the right people. So I want to talk about that, that idea of, of firing these missiles or, or swinging our sword in, in these three different areas and see how important each one is in regard to us just being that person. Is, I want to stand in the gap for, for folks. I, I want to bear a burden for people. I want to lift up my family. They don't know Christ, and I want them to come to, to know Christ. So let, let's look at this, mor- this morning. Look at that first direction of the missile. It's fired in the direction of Satan. I mean, that's the first place our, our sword goes to. Let me put it this way. We're not trying to kill sinners, all right? We're not trying to destroy sinners. We want to destroy the kingdom of darkness. That's our goal. Sinners are not our enemy, amen? God loves sinners. God wants to see sinners saved. That's how you got saved. God loved you enough to send his son to die for you. But God has given us this important responsibility as you study the New Testament to realize that you have a a place in this war against the spiritual forces of wickedness. You have an important place And that place is, first of all, to stand in that point of prayer and begin to move in the arena of spiritual warfare and to speak and to confess, to believe God's word, to pray God's word, and to see what God does in regard. Here's some things that will help you in understanding that person that you're praying for. 
There's two things, and they both regard Satan's activity in the heart and the mind of a person who doesn't know Christ as their Lord and Savior. First of all, the Bible teaches us that we are bound by Satan in our sin, that we're in bondage to sin. You find that all through the scriptures. Ephesians 2 makes reference to that passage there. It says, you are dead in your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked according to the course of the world, according to the prince of of the power of the air. What does that mean? You were in bondage to the devil before you came to Christ. The prince of the power of the air held you in captivity. That's the spirit that's working in the sons of disobedience. He says, among them, we too, we lived in the lust of our flesh. We indulged the desires of our flesh and the desires of our mind. And we were by nature, the children of wrath. What's he saying? We are held in bondage to sin. We're held in bondage to Satan. Any person outside of, of salvation, outside of being a new person in Christ Jesus, this is their identity. Second Timothy 2 says this, with all gentleness, he's talking to Christians, with all gentleness, we correct those who are in opposition. If perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of truth, that they may come to their sense, his senses and escape from the snare of the devil who has been holding them captive to do his will. In other words, simply put, you can't stop sinning just because you want to. Does that shock you a little bit? If you don't know Christ, you don't stop sinning just because you want to. Why, why is that? Because you are in bondage to sin. You are in bondage to Satan. The Bible says we are children of wrath. But when Jesus Christ comes, opens our heart and our mind. We choose in faith to repent of our sins. We come to the cross, yield our lives to Christ. It's amazing how God peels away the bondage in our life. And much of our life, we see God still peeling away bondage throughout our walk with Christ. But the emancipation begins by surrendering our life to Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, you have not chosen me, I've chosen you. That's one of those verses that causes those other people to say, oh, well, not everybody, you know, it's not God's will for everybody to be saved. Don't misunderstand this. You know, there's one day that we're going to see the complete pendulum swing. You say, what do you mean? On one side is the pendulum swings. We see this whosoever will may come. That same pendulum of the gospel of grace and peace swings to the other side. And it says chosen from before the foundations of the earth. You say, well, where's the balance? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I've argued with stronger minds than mine and we've all still lost. The secret things belong to God. What I do know is God has said, preach the gospel to all nations, that God would have all men everywhere to be saved, that we have a divine obligation to share Christ with a lost world. And not only to share Christ, he says here, but we pray for them because this is where the battle is. We want to pray that God would set them free. But also, not only is a person bound, the Bible says they're blinded by Satan. How many times have you been frustrated because you have someone you care about and you're trying to tell them about Jesus and they just don't see it? The Bible says that Satan has blinded the mind of unbelievers lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel in the face of Christ Jesus. Now that's powerful truth right there. Listen carefully to it. He has blinded the minds of unbelievers lest they should see the light of the glorious gospel. I don't know about you, before I knew Christ, the, the gospel was not glorious at all. I see people jumping up and down, shouting excited about Jesus, and I say, what is that? What is wrong with those people? I guess they need a crutch, you know? They must be a little sick. I guess they need a healer. Didn't understand what was going on. Didn't see the glory of God. Didn't see the glory of Jesus. Didn't understand the principles of grace and love and mercy that God was using in my life even at that time. I rejected, I resisted, I laughed at them. I scorned those kind of people. I ridiculed, I used God's name in vain. I mean, I didn't want anything to do with it. Why? I was bound and I was blind. But when Jesus comes, and you get to the place of surrender and you get to the place of brokenness and you get to the place of humility. That's when revival breaks loose. Salvation comes and change takes place in your heart. 
When the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, in whose case the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelieving. Who is the God of this world? It's Satan. Who's the God of this age? It's Satan. But for every person who's come to know Christ, it is, it, it's been on the basis of them having their mind and their eyes finally come open. In Isaiah chapter one, it says, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Come, use your mind. How am I gonna do that? God has to open your heart and he opens your mind. Let me give you a couple of things you need to understand in, in regard to this aspect and this part of the spiritual warfare. And you need to understand it about the devil. One, first and foremost, Jesus defeated the devil. Yes. Let me say it again. Jesus defeated the devil already. No, he's going to defeat him when he comes. And like, no, he's defeated the devil already. The scriptures tells us, therefore, since the children share in flesh and blood, that Jesus himself likewise also took on a body, partook of the same, that through death, his death, he might render powerless him who had the power of death, and that's the devil. What's he saying here? He took the power of death from the devil. He took the devil's authority, took the devil's power, he took the keys to life and death from the devil. It puts it this way in the book of Colossians, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, that were hostile to us. He has taken it out of the way, nailed it to the cross, and he disarmed the rulers and authorities, talking about demonic forces and the devil, and he made a public display of them, having triumphed over them through him. What's he saying here? Jesus conquered the devil. He whipped him at the cross. And the Bible says he openly, openly, unashamedly conquered Satan. He did that on your behalf. It, it puts it this, this is interesting the way it puts it because Paul's making reference to uh, how, how crimes of the state were handled in regard especially to, to, to Rome. That when someone committed a crime against the state of Rome, that there would be a certificate of ordinance written out. And on that certificate of ordinance, it would contain whatever offenses, whatever crimes you had broken, they would be penciled out, pinned out on that parchment. That parchment was then taken with you to the prison cells and was pinned, nailed to a door. So the guards would know that if you were supposed to serve three years, six months, two days, whatever it was, once you had fulfilled your sentence, they would know when that was done because the certificate of ordinance, it was against you and it was hostile to you. It was keeping you in prison. And so until you had paid for your offenses, do the time, you know, because you did the crime kind of thing, you stayed in the prison. But when the day came for release, the certificate of ordinance would be taken down and it would be signed by Roman authorities, sealed with a Roman seal, and we rewritten something like this. Telestai would be stamped upon it. Paid for. Your crimes, your transgressions have been absolved. Your debt's been paid. You can go free. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ took that certificate of ordinances that was against us and nailed it to his cross. He paid the price for your sin at the cross. He died on the cross to set you free. Free from what? Free from sin, free from Satan, free from bondage, free from blindness. You've been made free. So understand when you're praying for people, they have these two issues, they got, they got some problems. Problem number one, they're blind. Problem number two, they're, they're bound, they're, they're defeated. But here's the beautiful part. Understand that as we talk about Jesus overcoming the devil, the second part of that truth is this. You understand that Jesus defeated the devil and he gave you Jesus's authority. It's been placed in your hand. Jesus said, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and earth. So now you go. We're operating no longer under the devil's dominion. We're operating under a new kingdom dominion and a new authority and it's the authority of the Lord Jesus and he has placed that authority in our hand. We have been given a badge, so to say. All right, I have been given the emblem I need. It's the cross that proves that I am working for a higher authority than even the state of Texas, the city of Houston or whatever, or the United States of America. I work for a higher authority. And just as much as I'm doing Things that might be against the law, if I'm driving down the road in a 30 mile an hour zone, I'm doing 55, I see there's a car behind me and it has some lights and it has an emblem representing some authority 
and it's driven by a guy in a uniform with a gun, with a badge on, representing an authority, I have to legally respond to that authority. I pull over or face the consequences and will probably face the consequences for what I did. Now, who gave that guy the authority to pull me over? It's, I know you've all asked that before, right? <laughs> the government gave that guy the authority to do that. All right, the people gave that guy the authority to do that. Bible says in, in, in Second Peter, the first Peter, that we do, we respond to authority because they're there for our protection. But here's the thing about it in the spiritual realm, you have the authority of Jesus. Did Satan respond to the authority of Jesus? Did demons respond to the authority of Jesus? <laughs> you bet they did. Ah, Jesus, what am I to do with you? <laughs> I believe when we're walking in the spirit and we're living for Christ, that I think when we speak, Satan responds as well. I believe with all my heart that we've been given this authority to speak, to live in, to move in, to believe, and to trust God. And so that Satan has to respond to us. Jesus said, therefore I say to you, that the, uh, to say unto the mountain, be thou removed, cast in the sea. You not doubt in your heart. You believe those things which you say will come to pass. He shall have whatever he saith. Now remember, we talked about this last week in regard to spiritual warfare. Jesus was teaching his disciples about warfare. Remember, they couldn't cast the demon out of the boy. That's the context. They get Jesus. Jesus come, speaks to the demon, get out, and he goes. They come back later and say, okay, uh, how come that didn't work for us? So Jesus said, this guy didn't come out by prayer, but by prayer and fasting. And what was Jesus always doing? He's always praying. All right, he had a connection. He knew who he was. He knew what he was here for. He knew the means that he could operate under. He said, listen, everything I do, I'm just doing because my father has revealed it to me. The son of himself does nothing, only does what the father. And then Jesus went on to teach his disciples, Without me, you can do nothing, all right? So how do we know? We seek the will of God. We learn the word of God. We understand the truth of God. And Jesus tells the disciples, if you want the demon to go, tell him to go. Amen. Satan, get out of here in Jesus' name. We, we invoke the authority that we have. I don't have to say, pull over in the name of the law. I have to say, get out in the name of Jesus. And that's the authority that we have. And Satan has to respond to that authority. And people have, haven't understood that verse. They perverted that verse. It's been convoluted and misunderstood. In Matthew 16, Jesus says, I give unto you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatsoever you shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever you shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now we know we read that from the Amplified that the, the, the King James kind of got the tenses of those verbs kind of turned around. Literally it says, whatever is loosed in heaven, you can loose on earth. Whatever's bound in heaven, you can bind on earth. Well, Satan's bound in heaven, so I can bind him. Now, I've been given a domain, all right? Now, don't miss this. It's not like you stand up there and rebuke the devil all over the world. <laughs> all right, but God's given me authority in my dominion, in my domain right here. I become a steward over my family. I become a steward in my, in my atmosphere. I become a steward in my church. I become a steward in the areas of ministry that I have. And that's where God wants me to invoke his authority, where I am, that where I am, he may be also, amen, so that he's manifest, his presence is made known. But I'm living and speaking and moving and operating on his behalf. I don't operate in the power of Job. When I do, I fall flat on my face. So the real tense of this verse is you have the power to loose what's already been loosed. The Bible, Jesus again in Matthew 12 is talking about spiritual warfare. And he's talking about setting people free. And he uses it in the context of, of, a, of a, someone who would break into somebody's house. And if they want to steal everything in the house or take possession of everything in the house, they have to deal with the, the owner, the strong man of the house. And he's talking about spiritual warfare when, when he talks about this. He says, if I cast out demons by the spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come among you. But how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man? And then he will plunder his house or else how can anyone enter the strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man and then he will spoil his, his goods. What's he saying? He says in prayer, here's the bottom line. In prayer, we're standing against the enemy to rebuke him, to bind him and to stop him from doing what he's been doing. To rebuke him, to stop him and to hinder him from what he's been doing in my life, what he's been doing in my wife, what he's been doing in my kids, what he's been, he been doing in my grandkids, what he's been doing in my, in my church. We all have this same authority. It's not for a select little group of priests because we are all priests unto the Lord. 
And we all have this ministry of the priest of the Lord to be his representative voice in this spiritual battle and say, this is what the Lord dictates. This is what the Lord commands. And in Jesus name, it is so. Now with the disciples in the issue with the demon, their problem, if you look back into, into, into Matthew 10, it was an issue of unbelief. You know, Jesus had told them, but they just didn't believe it. We have to come to the place of faith and belief that I do believe that when I say Jesus, demons tremble. If I'm singing about Jesus, demons tremble. I want you to know if there were any demons left in that room by the time they got to owe the blood. They were screaming and cringing. I, I just believe that. I just, can you almost see it in your mind how that, I mean, just look what happened in the presence of Jesus when the demons manifest themselves. They're screaming and wailing and running and hiding. What are we to do with thee? Oh, throw us into those pigs at least. Let us get out of here. <laughs> then the pigs committed suicide. Satan's defeated. This is the first and most important part of this message, and it's the lengthiest part of this message. But the idea is this is done in prayer, where we're loosing and claiming and binding and rebuking. In fact, that's what the word prayer has to, it literally means. It, it is the Greek word deomayo you know, that he's talking about here. But it's that matter of I, I will loose, I will set free. The word deomayo, by the way, is a word which has to do with that. Deomayo, the word deo has to do with binding something, knitting something together, putting something at or, or taking charge of something, holding it. And that's, that's the word translated many times, supplication. What am I doing in the supplication? I'm asking God to meet the needs. How can I do that? Because he said he would. So I'm just bringing heaven down into earth with my prayer. I'm trusting what God said. I'm believing what God said. How do I know I'm believing? Because I am praying it. I am saying it. I am standing on it. I'm moving in it. That's how, that's how we know I'm believing. I want you to know Satan's power is broken, right? But it will not go or let go until we exercise our authority and faith. In prayer, we do this. So what do we do? We first fire the missiles towards the strong man in the enemy's direction and he has to let go in prayer because of what Christ has done on the cross. I can experience the faith of Calvary. I stand in what God's done for me. And because of where I am in Jesus, my position in Christ, who I am in Christ and the authority he's given me in Christ, in his name, I can bind, I can lose, I can rebuke, I can claim whatever it is that God's telling me to do. I am praying, I'm trusting, I'm believing. We, what are we doing? Really, bottom line is, we're cooperating with God. Now, in the lift groups, you'll, they're going to get a little bit more about what that means in a specific format as I pray for people. When I'm praying for you, I'm praying that, you know, these, these demonic forces will be cut off, not only from the person I'm praying for, but even communication with each other. One of the great illustrations of this is in the Old Testament, whenever the enemy is coming against the people of God, how many times do we see God do something? A word is spoken, a song of praise is sung, a command is given, but all of a sudden at this point of obedience and faith to whatever God's told the people to do, the enemy becomes confounded and confused and falls on their own swords or sets swords against each other. I pray that, that that will happen. I pray that people would sense that God's doing something in their life. I pray that their eyes would be open. I pray that understanding would come. I pray that their mind be freed. I, I pray that the very things that are holding them in captivity, and if I know what they are, I speak to that. I rebuke the spirit of adultery. I rebuke the spirit of immorality. I rebuke the spirit of fornication. I rebuke the spirit of addiction. I rebuke the spirit of homosexuality. Whatever it is, I get specific. And guess what happens? Things happen. Amen. And they do. And you know this by your own experience if you'll take time to look back over your life. That when you've been specific and when you have known that you heard from God about something and you stand in prayer on that promise from God and you refuse to move from it, you've seen God do things above and beyond the natural into the realm of the supernatural. This is the way God moves. Now, the second era, the next two aren't, aren't as lengthy as that. I want to agree that God would send people. This is kind of in the direction of the saints. Listen to Matthew 9. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful. In other words, there's a lot of people ready to be saved. But the workers are few. Amen. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out workers in the harvest. Do what? Pray to who? The Lord of the harvest. What am I doing? Pray that God would send out workers into his harvest. You say, well, I'm working. Good. Now pray for more. 
It's part of our prayer life. We're praying that God would, as he prepares the heart of the sinner by rebuking Satan off their life, that he would prepare, the, prepare people to be soul winners, prepare people to speak up, prepare people to be evangelists, prepare people to share the gospel. He said, and he calls him, pray to the Lord of the harvest. So we're talking about prayer warfare and praying for the lost. God's the God of the harvest. The Lord, so who are we talking to? We're talking to the Lord to bind, to tie, to knit. To, to, we're supplicating for him to do a work in people's hearts and lives. How often do we need to do this? It's every day. Today, if you have a lost loved one, you're praying for it, say, today, Father, as I pray for, fill in the blank, all right? As I pray, that I pray that God, not only would Satan be bound from his understanding, from his mind, keeping him in bondage, but his eyes would be open, but also God, wherever he goes, whether it's to school, whether it's to work, it's if in traffic, that somewhere there'd be a witness being raised up him everywhere, everywhere he goes today. And Lord, if it's a bumper sticker, don't let him miss it. Don't let him miss it. Pray in the, in the direction of the saints so that they'd hear from God and begin to share the same message that you have been sharing already. Pray for the saints to be faithful, pray for them. And you see this a lot in the New Testament. Paul is telling them, pray for the saints. Pray for me that the door of opportunities is open, that I have boldness to speak. Over and over, there's just multitudes of illustrations that we want to get into just to do the time factor, but it's in the word of God. You're praying in the direction of the enemy. You're praying in the direction of the saints. But there's one other area. It might not be the one you think. It's in the direction of the Savior. John 6 says, no man comes to the Father except to me except the Father which has sent me. Draw him and I'll raise him up in the last days. Nobody comes to Christ on their own accord, in other words. Somebody just doesn't wake up and say, oh, I'll get saved today. Good day to get saved. Doesn't happen that way. We come because the Father draws us. When Jesus is speaking to his disciples in John 16, just before the crucifixion, he's in the upper room. He says, I'm leaving and I'm going. He said, but when I go, I'm gonna send another, the comforter. And he's going, to, he's going to teach you, but here's what he's going to do. He will reprove, correct the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. Now, that's the ministry that Jesus had, and that's why they hated him, because they didn't like being corrected for their sin. Jesus is the light of the world. So wherever the light went, darkness was exposed. And I don't know about you, nobody likes to be corrected, right? <laughs> nobody likes to be told they're doing wrong, but the very presence of Jesus did that. And it'll be in the same route. Why? Because the Spirit of God brings that conviction. So what we do, he said, we're, we, God, I'm praying that you would bring conviction to this person in their life, that your Holy Spirit would draw them. The very first work of the Holy Spirit in all of our lives is this work of conviction, where we're being drawn, where our eyes are getting open, where the Holy Spirit's speaking to us, where truth's becoming evident to us. And the, the eyes of understanding begin to be enlightened and we begin to see what is right and what is wrong and what God desires. We read from 2 Timothy 2, he said, you're praying that God grant them repentance. That's what he said, pray that God grant them repentance. Why? Because people without God will never repent on their own. Isn't it amazing? God calls us to be saved. We can't even do that on our own. We need God. And this is where conviction, because when God says you need to be saved, guess what that means? Let me tell you the bottom line, you can be saved now. That's what that means. I mean, if you're here with that Christ today and the Holy Spirit's pulling at your heart, and I think you know what that means, even though you may not be familiar with Christianese, all right, you still understand, God, God dealing with something. There's something going on in here. I can't explain it. No it's God. That's, you have to understand, that's, that's a gift conviction is. It's a blessing. It's not something we run from. I did for years. I didn't want to know it. I didn't want to hear that, la, 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 la kind of thing, you know? I don't want to know the truth. Don't tell me the truth. I don't care about the truth. I just want what I want. I'm the truth. That's what most people think, amen? Listen to what Jesus says in John 14. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will also do. Greater works than these will he do because I go to the Father. So whatever you ask in my name, that will I do. So that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Here's a clear invitation for us to carry out the work of God. Here's a clear invitation for us to, clear, to carry out the will of God. And the way to do that, he says, if you want to do the works of the Father, then it's going to be done in the, in the context of asking. You want to see the great works of God? Ask. It comes through prayer. And in praying, we realize that God's the one who's in charge of all things. So I'm praying, God, move and minister. Let, do that great work in this person's life, in this, this, this family's life. 
You told me if I ask anything that's according to your will, that you will grant those petitions. I mean, 1 John 5, 14, this is the confidence that we have. We have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He hears us. Well, what am I doing? Well, God said he's this will to save people, so I'm praying according to his will, right? So if I'm praying according to his will, he wants to save people. Well, a saved person needs to be saved, but he's blind and he's bound. So I'd ask you in the name of Jesus, rebuke Satan off his life. And Satan, in Jesus' name, you have no authority there because literally Jesus died for all men, so he belongs to Jesus. Get out of there. And God, God just opened his eyes, opened his understanding. Rebuke, rebuke Satan, whatever demons are ministering to him. And I said, don't be afraid to be specific in that regard. Redo the, and Lord, not only do I pray that Satan be bound, you know, I, I'm, I'm praying, God, that you raise up people all around this person that he just keep hearing Jesus wherever he goes, seeing Jesus, whatever he does. Let it be on every billboard, every car, bumper sticker, whatever it is, you know, just convict him. And then Lord, as we pray for harvesters, Lord, pray for me. I'll be a harvester too. But Lord, you tell us it's clear that nobody's going to be saved unless you, you convince them and you convict them. So I ask you in Jesus' name, today you convict them. Now, how often do we pray like this? It's every day. It's every day. And let me say in regard to this praying like this every day, God is moving every day. God is working every day. Well, I just don't see it, Brother Joe. I always like people call me Brother Joe. You get more formal, you call me Pastor Joe. I just don't see it, Pastor Joe. Not with your physical eyes. I remember Phil had a, my brother who sits on the front row here, had a group of people praying for me like this. He would ask me, talk on the phone or see, I'd see he said, how you doing? I said, I'm just doing miserable. Now, I don't know Jesus and they're praying for me. I'm doing miserable. He said, great. <laughs> great. You need to get saved. I said, shut up. I don't want to be saved. You're miserable. And they just keep praying. He just thought that was great. <laughs> thought that was wonderful. By the way, thank you for that. Maybe, you know, just think in your own situation. And there's a lot of folks here, I suppose, today that are actually Christians. This church, by the way, right? Jack Taylor put it this way. Great evangelist, pastor, Castles Baptist Church, many years in San Antonio. Nobody ever gets saved without somebody praying for them. Let's just bring this down to personal experience. Uh, how many of you, before you met the Lord, there was somebody you knew was praying for you? Maybe you found out after the fact, but you know that somebody prayed for you. Raise your hand. Just, 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 see, see what I mean? Somebody prayed for you. So it would be well and good today maybe to shoot out a little email or a little tweet or a text or something that says, thank you. <laughs> thank you for praying for me. Somebody's praying for you. But you can't, you can't measure what God is doing by what you're seeing in the moment. You just trust God that he's doing something. You leave the when and the where up to God. That's his business. In his time, by his mercy and his grace, it, I believe, what the Bible says, I believe God's moving. It's going to happen. Sooner or later, maybe on their deathbed. I don't know. That's God's business. I can't control that. I just know that God is sovereign, and I trust his sovereignty. I want all my prayers answered right now. <laughs> Am I the only one? Hey, right not now. In Jesus' name, man. <laughs> Answer him right now. But it may be like in my situation, there are months and months and months of God just peeling me like a, not like a banana, like an onion. Because there was layer after layer that had to be peeled off and dealt with. When I finally came to the place to give my life to Jesus, nobody had to beg me to come down and I'll play 42 verses of just as I am. <laughs> I was ready to get saved. I didn't care what it meant, what it cost, what it involved. I was just sick of being who I was. And the Bible said there was something better. That works for me. Well, there is something better. There's someone better. His name is Jesus, and he's ready to change and transform your life. And he's also ready to change and transform the lives of the people that are all around you every day. People you work with, people you go to school with. Why don't you start a strategic prayer list where you start praying for people like this? A strategic prayer list says, you know, that person is lost. And if something doesn't happen, they're going to die and go to hell. Not on my watch. Not on my watch. Let's pray with all prayer. 
without ceasing. Be persistent. And it is daily. We may see a great victory in someone's life today, but they haven't chosen Jesus yet. We keep praying. There may be a great moment of, 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 of illumination for them, but we keep praying. We want them to come all the way to the cross. Don't bail them out. You listening to me? We have, we have terrible time doing that with our kids sometimes. We keep bailing them out. They never get to the cross. Why? Because I keep diverting them. I keep, I keep bearing the burden. I keep taking care of them. I keep, I keep, I keep picking up the load. Well, you know, it's the old tough love thing, but we have to do it also with our prayer life. Be, be consistent. Trust God. Trust God. Jeremiah 33, 3, I've mentioned it every sermon. I'll close this one with it. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Call unto me. Give God the opportunity to do something because you take the discipline of time to ask him. Let's stand with our heads bowed. Father, we come to you today and Lord, as we share this message, there may be even those folks in this room today who've never come to this.